Hi everyone, welcome to Susicon Digital 2020. Let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Stefan Haas and I'm a software engineer here at SUSE. And I'm delighted that I got the chance to talk to you about SUSE Enterprise Storage 6 um, on SUSE CAS platform. This is a tech preview of running Rook on top of Kubernetes. So what to expect in the next couple of minutes? My talk is divided into six parts. I will start with what is Rook. Then I will uh, have a look at real short about Kubernetes. So what is Rook, uh, Kubernetes all about? And the basic things I will you, you need to know if you want to understand um, the tech preview here. Next, we will have a look at the concepts of Rook as also the use cases of Rook in combination with Kubernetes. I will give you a short introduction in how to install the tech preview how to install Rook in your Kubernetes cluster, and finally it is demo time. Let me start with some general information on Rook. So what is Rook? As the slide says, says Rook is an open source cloud native storage orchestrator, providing a platform as also a framework and support for a diverse set of storage solutions to natively, and this is the key point, integrate um, with Kubernetes. Besides Ceph, what we will have a look at, Rook also supports, for example, MinU, NFS, or HFS. Um, Rook brings all the advantages of an automated application containers management service like Kubernetes is to the world of distributed storage systems. So it turns your distributed storage system into a self-managing, self-scaling, and to a certain po point also a self-healing storage service. It automates the tasks, at a lot of tasks, of a storage administrator. For example, um, it does automatically for you the bootstrapping, the configuration, the scaling, as also the upgrading. It has some means of a disaster recovery. You get um, handles for monitoring and you get some kind of resource management for all your um, containers and pods in, in regards of Rook and your storage system. Um, as I said, I will have a real short look into what is Kubernetes. So it is an open source system for automating, deployment, scaling and management of containerized application. Um, it has some means of service discovery as also load balancing. You can have automated rollouts and in case of a failure also automated rollbacks. Um, it has some, some kind of a self-healing and a secret in configuration management. Um, Kubernetes allows you, as it says on its own homepage, to automatically mount a storage system of your choice, such as local storage, public cloud providers and more. Um, and this is the point where Rook hooks, hooks into. So Kubernetes does not do that natively, it needs some integration. Um, let me also introduce a couple of basic concepts and uh, objects of Kubernetes at least those which are necessary to understand the rest of my talk. Um, the, a pod, for example, this is the basic execution unit of a Kubernetes um, application. So it, this uh, a pod encapsulates one or more containers, um, the storage resources, um, the network working um, options, as also the runtime options. A service, this is an abstract way to expose an application running on a set of pods, this is important, as a network service um, to your Kubernetes cluster. And Kubernetes auto automatically creates a DNS name for this set of pods and gives you um, all the abilities of automated load balancing. With namespaces, Kubernetes has it, its own concept of a way to divide your cluster um, in, in a set of various areas. Um, one of the main features of Kubernetes are the so-called controllers. Um, a controller, depending of its kind, is declaring the state of your application. So how many pods do you want to, ha to, to, to have running at the same time? Um, where should those pods are lo uh, get located? On which nodes, for example? And stuff like that. Um, the next co basic concept are the so-called volumes. This is just a directory which, which is accessible to the containers in, in a pod or, or in your pod. And 
this is more specific thing of Kubernetes, but this is pretty um, important for for Rook. Um, the next thing uh, is the so-called custom resource definition. This is a handle to extend Kubernetes by your own objects. So in case of Rook, we will extend um, Kubernetes, the Kubernetes API by, for example, Ceph cluster or Ceph file system. So after installing um, Rook, um, Kubernetes is aware about what is a Ceph cluster, what, what is a Ceph file system, and knows what to do. So in our case, take all the, um, the queries and redirect it to, to Rook. Um, containers emerged as a way to make software portable. So the container contains all the packages you need to run a service. The provided file system makes containers extremely portable and easy to use in development, for example. Um, a container can be moved from development to test or to production with no relative with no or relatively few configuration changes. But nevertheless, um, a lot of applications also need storage, and the storage is not something which is easily portable. So in Kubernetes, you have three different objects available um, for storage. Um, the, ones, the first thing I want to talk about is the so-called persistent volume, a PV. This is a piece of storage in the cluster that has been provisioned either by the administrator, so the administrator um, really declares this is a persistent volume of, let's say, like 5 gigabyte, and this, um, this PV is some cloud storage at, for example, Amazon or uh, stuff like that. Or it is automatically provisioned using um, storage classes. More on that later. So a PV is really like a resource, like a node. So this is something you, you need to declare somewhere. Um, as also, and this means um, automatically that a PV, a persistent volume, the, li the life cycle of it, it's independent from a part that uses it. And in opposite th to that, there is the concept of a persistent volume claim, a so-called PVC. That this is real the request for storage by a user or by a part. Um, it is an actual instance, like a part. Um, so claims can be requested by a specific size and by 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 access mode, for example. You say, okay, my part here needs um, three gig of, 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 of storage and I need to have read write access to that. And last but not least, um, um, I will give you a short introduction about storage classes. A storage class provides a way for administrators to describe the classes of storage which are available or which are offered by your Kubernetes system. Um, this is more or less um, an automated way of creating persistent volumes. This means PVCs can get created automatically on behalf of a storage class. Um, just to go a step back, so if you create a PVC or if, you, if a user requests a PVC, um, Kubernetes will have a look into the persistent volumes if there is somewhere something which can um, um, fulfill all the requests by the user. If there is nothing available anymore, so Kubernetes cannot fulfill the request and your pod cannot start. If you have configured some kind of a storage class, um, Kubernetes will automatically use this storage class and create an additional PVC. Um, exactly um, like the user requested it. This is the architecture of Kubernetes, just as again as a real short overview. So the master, the so-called Kubernetes control plane, um, is divided in a couple of main components. So on the one hand you have the etcd, this is a simple key value data store for, config, uh, for all the configuration of your Kubernetes cluster. The API server, this is a key component which serves the Kubernetes API using JSON over HTTP, uh, HTTP um, and it handles both the, int the internal as also the in uh, external interface um, to Kubernetes. The scheduler, um, the scheduler selects which nodes um, should be used for an unscheduled pod. It takes care for the resource requests, the constraints you might have, as also the labels. Um, 
the last part I want to talk about um, in the Kubernetes control plane is the so-called controller manager. So the controller manager is a process that manages a set of core Kubernetes controllers. Um, if you remember on the last slides, I was shortly um, uh, I was talking about the controller. So the controller manager is really taking care that if you, for example, declared a, a daemon set which says, okay, I want to have three of my pods running at the same time. And the controller manager has its own um, uh, loop and it takes care from and, and looks from time to time that you really, for example, three, all the three of your pods are running currently. And if not, it will automatically start um, a new request to that the pod gets restarted or rescheduled to another node if the node, for example, is out of order or stuff like that. Um, the Kubernetes nodes are consisting of the so-called kubelet. Um, the kubelet is responsible for running um, for, for running the state uh, of each node and it's also responsible for ensuring that all containers on the node are healthy. So it takes care that the, the, the containers are running, it takes care um, that the resource requests you, you might have set to, um, to your containers are still valid and stuff like that. Um, there is also the kube proxy um, running on each and every um, Kubernetes node, which is responsible to take care of the um, 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 of the communication between the users, which are directly talking to a pod and stuff like that. And you have the as a sure uh, as a real minor component, for example, the C advisor, with which is having uh, which which has a look at the uh, resource consumption and stuff like that. Now let's come to to the main um, topic of this talk. This is Rook. So I will give you an overview about the concepts of Rook. So on the one hand you have um, the Rook operator. This is a simple container that has all that is needed to bootstrap and monitor the storage cluster. The operator will start and monitor Ceph, monitor pods, the Ceph OSD daemons to provide radar storage as well as start and manage assets, um, um, the other Ceph daemons. Um, the operator manages CRDs, so the custom resource definitions for pools, object stores like S3, Swift, and file systems by initializing the pods and other artifacts necessary to run the services. The Rook operator also initializes the agents that are needed for consuming the storage. Rook automatically configures the Ceph CSI driver to mount the storage to your pods. The, um, the Flex driver is still also configured automatically, so will soon be deprecated in favor um, of, the CSM, of the CSI driver. Um, this is how Rook integrates into, um, into your Kubernetes cluster. So Rook enables Ceph storage systems to run on Kubernetes using the Kubernetes primitives. So this image illustrates how Ceph Rook integrates with Kubernetes. With Ceph running in the Kubernetes cluster, Kubernetes applications can mount block devices and file system managed by Rook or can use the S3 Swift API for ob object storages. Um, the Rook operator automated, automates configuration of storage components and monitors uh, the cluster, it monitors the cluster to ensure the storage remains available and healthy. The Rook Ceph image includes all the necessary tools to manage the cluster. There are no changes to the data pass at all. Rook does not attempt to maintain full fidelity with Ceph. Many of the Ceph concepts like placement groups and crash maps are hidden so you don't have to worry about them. Instead, Rook creates a much simplified user um, experience for admins that is in terms of physical resources, pools, volumes, file systems um, and buckets. At the same time, advanced configuration can be applied when needed with the Ceph tools. So the Ceph tools are still available and you can do all the advanced stuff um, you want to do or which you would do to your, um, let's say, um, physical um, Ceph cluster running natively on some bare metal machines. Um, 
Rook also has to uh, provides three different types of storages. So, like you know it, or like you are, like, you know it from from ordinary Ceph clusters. You have on the one hand block storage, so a, a shared file system which can be mounted with read write permissions from multiple pods. You have object storage. Um, the object storage exposes um, an S3 API to the storage cluster for applications to put and put and get data. And you have you can create a shared file system. This can be mounted with read write permissions also from multiple pods. So what are the use cases? How can you integrate Ceph or Rook into your Kubernetes cluster? Um, the first use case is the so-called pure Ceph cluster. So each worker node runs only Ceph as workload. So the Ceph cluster running, the Ceph cluster itself is running on its own separate Kubernetes cluster, which serves multiple other client um, Kubernetes clusters for storage. This is probably not common, and this is a use case you won't see very often um, in the real world. So most would use, a tr in this case, most would use a traditional non-Kubernetes deployment of their Ceph workload. The next use case is the shared Kubernetes and Ceph cluster. So, but here in this case, the Kubernetes cluster is split. You have dedicated storage nodes for Ceph, and you have dedicated compute nodes for containers and workloads. Like you see here on the slide, you have a couple of master nodes, um, you have a couple of worker nodes, which are really just dedicated for running all the Ceph workload, and you have a couple of worker nodes for running all the containers you and the pods you're running usually in your Kubernetes environment. And last but not least, um, there is the, the use case of a unified Kubernetes and Ceph cluster. So all nodes in your cluster run both Ceph as also ordinary and normal containers. Uh, most common co-located deployment storage and compute. So you have on the one hand the master nodes like you have in each and every Kubernetes cluster and on the worker nodes you have running at the same time the Ceph containers which are using utilizing um, the storage attached to the nodes and at the same time they are running some some ordinary workloads you're running in your Kubernetes cluster. How does Rook utilize, um, uh, how does SUSE utilize Rook um, in the moment and in the future? So for SES6, Rook is a technology preview. Please test it, tell us your experiences. We are eager to get, um, to get information from your side, how you see Rook, how it worked in combination with SES6, how you want to use Rook, which use case are you looking at? For SES7, Rook on SUSE CAS platform will be a supported stack. So let's have a look at how to install the tech preview, how to install Rook um, in your SES6, um, with SES6 in your current CASP environment. So this is really about the installation of the tech preview. Um, f for SES7, we are looking for a much easier and much simpler um, way of installing Rook. To install Rook, there are a couple of basic manifests you have to have a look at and which you need to apply to your Kubernetes cluster. Tho those manifests you will find under the location user share Kubernetes YAML Rook Ceph if you install the RPM package um, which includes all our um, Rook um, YAML files. The first file I want to talk about is the so-called common.yaml. This creates the common resource definitions which are needed by Rook as also the Rook namespace. So by default, Rook creates its own namespace in your Kubernetes cluster and all the, the Rook um, pods as also the Ceph pods will run in this namespace. The common.yaml also includes the pod security policies. Th those are needed um, that your, um, for example, Ceph daemons are able to um, to mount devices, are able to um, to attach devices to your node and stuff like that. 
The next manifest I want to talk about is the so-called operator YAML. This one really creates the deployment for the Rook operator. So the, part, the, the operator pod in the end you will see in your cluster and which is responsible for, for managing the Ceph cluster. In this file you have various configuration options you might want to have a look at. For example the Rook log level, the Rook monitor um, timeout or the device um, the discover device interval, how often Rook should have a look at your nodes if there are new st if there are new storages which got attached to the nodes for example. Um, the most important part here is the, um, the cluster YAML. This creates and configures the Rook Ceph cluster. Um, in this file you configure the placement of the pods so in this file you um, you declare let's say it like that the use case of your uh, we were talking about a couple uh, a couple of minutes ago you you declare how many Ceph months you want to have running you declare if you want to uh, if you want to run the dashboard and how you want to run it in H with um, HTTPS or without HTTPS and stuff like that you can declare the resource requests and limits for your pods. And last but not least, the most important part, you declare the storage configuration. So which nodes should be used, um, which devices on those nodes, nodes should be used. Do you want to use all nodes automatically? Do you want to use all available devices automatically? So for testing, go ahead. But in your um, production cluster, you most probably will not do that. So I think now it's better to have um, to have a demo. So about all of, after all the slides, it's always good to have a look um, how it how how Rook runs in combination with Kubernetes and how Rook runs in combination um, with Ceph. The first thing I want to show you is my Kubernetes cluster. So as you can see here, I have a couple of nodes. I have one master node. So as you can see here, this is real. Um, uh, this cluster is using only for for testing purposes. I have three worker nodes and a couple of OSD nodes. Um, as I said, if you install Rook, so Rook is already installed on that machine because it would take too long. Um, and it would, uh, ye, I, the, the, it would increase the the time of my talk way too much. So here you can see um, Rook is already installed, and we have the so-called Rook Ceph namespace here. Now la, let's have a look into the Rook installation in detail. So first of all, I want to show you which services got installed by Rook. So. In my environment, I have the, dish, the dashboard um, configured, so I have a dashboard service. Um, we have a service for each and every monitor, so as you can see, I have three monitors configured in my cluster. We have the manager service, and for CSI, we have a couple of metric services installed by, by Rook. If you install um, Kubernetes or apply the Kubernetes YAML files to your CASP environment, you will get a couple of daemon sets. In this case, we get a daemon set for um, for this CFS CSI plugin as also for the RBD plugin and for as also a daemon set for Rook Discover. So Rook Discover is responsible um, for so Rook Discover is running on each and every node in your cluster and it takes a look if for example a new storage gets attached to your cluster and if yes um, it will automatically depending on your cluster configuration add it to your Ceph cluster. The next thing I want to show you are the so-called deployments. So by default Rook creates for each and every device a storage device um, on your cluster an own OSD deployment which you can see here so in my case you have we have 10 devices so we have 10 um, 10 different OSDs 
Here you also can see the Rook Ceph operator. This is the deployment responsible for the operator part. Um, and later we will have a look at the Rook Ceph tools deployment. This is um, a special um, uh, but this is running a special pod in your Kubernetes cluster which is not necessary but which is pretty handy because it includes all the Ceph tools you might um, you might need for example for tweaking your Ceph cluster or if you need to do some troubleshooting. Kubernetes all automatically creates a storage class for you so let's do it like that that you can see it better um, in this case, by default, we have a Rook Ceph block storage class, which can be used um, if a user create, um, requests a PVC, it will automatically use this Rook Ceph block device. And the next thing is, so I will, we will have a look at all of the components which are currently running in the Rook Ceph namespace. So just beware, this will be a lot of stuff. So let's start at the beginning. These are all the parts running in your Kubernetes cluster necessary um, to to run the the Ceph cluster in on on top of Casp. Um, you see all the CSI plugins running on each. These parts are running on each and every node which is configured as part as uh, on your Ceph cluster. Um, you will see here the RBD plugins. We will see um, some kind of crash collectors just to, to get all the necessary information in case of an of a crash. Um, we will see here, here this is the actual operator device, the operator part container running. Um, um, you will see all the discover demons, I am um, uh, sorry, parts running in your cluster. Um, we were talking about the deployment a couple of seconds ago. These are again the services, the, the daemon sets we were talking about, the deployments we have in our cluster, we have a couple of replica sets. So these are really details about Kubernetes, so if you're really interested in that, these are c different kind of controllers, a deployment or a replica set. Yeah, If you're interested in that, just have a look at the Kubernetes homepage there. The, the homepage is real verbose and so you can load a lot of stuff. And one thing you also might see in your cluster are the so-called prepare rook jobs. They are responsible on the first boot up um, of the kubelet and on the first boot up of the OSD pod itself. Um, this one is responsible for attaching, mounting and for example formatting your storage device. So as I said, we have in this cluster running this special um, Ceph tools part. Now I'm logging into logging into this part, and now we have access to the actual Ceph cluster. And in this part, this is the advantage of this: um, all the the command line tools are installed. For example, we can do uh, Ceph status and have a look into our Ceph cluster. This takes a while, so. So you can see here, okay, that's great, the health is okay, we have three monitors running, um, we have a quorum, we have one manager, we have 10 OSDs, um, 10 of out of 10 are up, which is also great. We have 100 gig available and 10 gig of all my, my available storage is in use currently. Um, we can also do a SAF, for example, OSD status. takes also a while so you now we get all the 10 OSDs running in our Ceph cluster all of them are in the state exists and up which is great you can have a look on uh, on what um, uh, what storage you have how many storage is available on each and every node and stuff like that um, we can do for example a Ceph DF So here again you can see we have a total of 100 gig, 90 gigs of that are available, we have 10 gigs in use. Um, these are the, two, the pools we have currently configured. The same we can do for example for RADAS. Oops. And we again 
we get pretty the same metrics, which is obvious. Um, a total space of 100 gig, 90 available, 10, 10 is used. So this was my last slide, or this is my last slide. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. Um, don't be afraid if there are any open questions or recommendations or marks or whatever you will find you saw my email address on the first slide don't worry ping me give me a note and i will try to answer as soon as possible again thank you for attention and um goodbye